Uh, what make is your watch? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, mine's an uh, Everlight British. And uh, we used to say British is the best, but I don't think it is any longer. Uh, and your car? What make is your car? And that presumably means that, okay, some workers in GM or in Ford or Volkswagen or Toyota made your car. And what make are your shoes? And you say, well, uh, don't be silly. I, I know my car and I maybe know my stereo, but I don't know what make my shoes are. And uh, who made you? And some of us might tend to say, well, well, that's a loaded question, and I'm kind of the result of a biological process. Well, then I push you on it a little. Who started the process? And, and who programmed it so that you would emerge from it? Because presumably someone or some mind must have given the process direction. So who really did that? Well, would you look with me, the ones at, at the one who did it? And it's John 1 and verse 3. John 1 and verse 3. It's page 922. John 1 and 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, who was that person? Well, if you look at one verse up in verse 1, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was with was God. And then all things were made through him. And verse 14 tells you a little more about who that him was. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Your nose and your hands, and your feet, and your hair were designed personally by Jesus. It was him that programmed your grandmother's body, and your great-grandmother's body, and your mum's body, so that you would turn out what you are today. So this Jesus made you. And he designed you personally. Now, some of the disabilities that you have inherited, he couldn't prevent without suspending the free will of your mum and your dad. And that's why it says in those same verses, you see, verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus' life that created you is what has produced all that is light and good in you. Now, he couldn't prevent some of the other things that you've inherited, your dad's inferiority complex or your mum's talkativeness. He couldn't prevent that without suspending their free wills, remaking them again, and breaking into the whole pattern of law that he had set up in nature. But all that is good and light in you is due to this dear person, Jesus, who designed you as you are at this moment. And in fact, he so arranged it that all the disadvantages that you've inherited from your mum and dad and from your great-grandmother and your great-grandfather, all those disadvantages will never be enough to overwhelm the good that he has planted in you in his original design. Now, that's what that verse means, you see, in verse 5. 
the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the very fact, presumably, that you're here this morning, whatever you think of God, is kind of indication that the darkness hasn't overcome it, however much it may have appeared to. Because somehow or other, the stamp that this Jesus has put on you is still working inside you and pulling you towards him. But it's Jesus, really, that made us. I think a lot of us have the idea, you know, it's some, some great élan vital or some great impersonal force or power of magnetism or electricity in the universe. It's Jesus. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so you were personally made by Jesus. And what really is important to see is that he had a definite purpose in making you. His purpose was this, to fulfill his own task. The task that his father gave him was to bring the whole universe into order, to bring it under his father's will, to bring it all into harmony. And Jesus resolved to make you so that he could express his own life through you. And by the power of his spirit that he gave to you, he would begin to fulfill the task his father had given him. So actually, you're designed by Jesus to do something in bringing the world under the control of the creator that nobody else in the whole universe can do. Now, loved ones, I think you have to grip that because I think some of you are used to so sitting in the midst of thousands and millions of people that you've lost that whole truth. And it is a fact that Jesus has designed you to do something that no one else in the whole universe can do. Does it not even speak to you regarding the truth of that, that there is nobody else like you? There is nobody else like you in the universe. There is not one other person that is exactly like you. Even your identical twin is very different from you inside. And loved ones, Jesus designed you for that purpose. He designed you to express his power of life through you in order to bring the universe under the will of his Father. And also so that you would in fact come to know his Father as he knows him. Because that's really what Jesus wants. He wants you to think the same way as his father, as he, about his father as he does. Now, you, you kind of get him saying that if you look at Matthew 10. Matthew 10. And verse 30 to 32. But it's page 844, you know, it's Matthew 10 and 30, verse 30. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And that's the person who made you speaking to you. And he says, look, I've even counted the hairs on your head. I know them. Nobody else in the universe knows that number. But I know them. And I know you intimately. And the reason I made you was so that you would come into this relationship with my dear father that I have. And so that you would be used by the power of his spirit to bring the universe into submission to his will. That's why you're here. That's why I made you. And that's why, loved ones, that verse, you remember, that we read in John, reads, his life is the light of men. Because it's Jesus' life that is the light that will guide you through your own life. It's Jesus' own life and the life of his Spirit that will be the light for you, that will tell you which way to turn, will tell you what you should be doing here in life. Now, of course, 
once you accept that explanation of reality, a huge number of benefits follow from that. Uh, I'd like you just to look at some of them, just they're so great. First of all, you really do begin to have a calm certainty when you're at school that Jesus knows what you're training for and has a job for you to fill when you get out of school. That's the first thing it brings. If this Jesus made you, and he knows why he made you, then you have kind of calm certainty throughout your time at school that he knows what he's training you for, even though you yourself may not understand it. He knows he has allowed you to come into this course. And he'll have a job for you when you get out of it. Oh, just other benefits. A real confidence that even the inconvenient events that happen in your life are under his control. Even the inconvenient events, even the unexpected things, right from the fender bender right up to the leukemia that you cannot control, all those events are under his control. Now, loved ones, you, you, you get it in, in Hebrews 2, if you look at Hebrews 2 and verses 7 and 8. Hebrews 2 and verses 7 and 8. Thou didst make him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything, this is talking about Jesus, you see, God has put everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So those inconvenient events that don't seem to be fitting into the pattern, we can be assured that Jesus has not let them go out as a wildcat event that he hasn't under control, but all of them are in subjection to him, and there is nothing that is outside his control. So, it brings you a great satisfaction that what you're doing at this present time is God's will for you. His ideal will or his permissive will. But a great rest and satisfaction that what I'm doing at the moment is what God wants me to do. It's not what I'll finally do, but it's what he wants me to do at this present time. And oh, just a, a great freedom, you know, from anxiety and from worry. Great freedom from angst about, am I on the right track or am I not? Once you really accept that it's this Jesus that made you and that he knows where you're going. And a great freedom about your relationship with other people and a great freedom to be related to them in the way that Jesus guides you. And just a great sense, you know, that whatever is happening, our lives are going to fulfill the purpose our maker has for them. And you get that kind of assurance if you, if you look at it in Ephesians 1 and verse 11. Ephesians 1 and verse 11. That however it may look to you at the present time, you can be sure that Jesus is going to bring the thing into line with the reason he made you. And it's Ephesians 1 and 11. In him, that is in Jesus. It's page 1017 once. 1017. In him, in Jesus, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. That Jesus does not let the thing run away from him. That he accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. And even the mistakes that you make, if you have an attitude of trust to him that he's in control, he's going to accomplish them 
according to the counsel of his own will for you. Loved ones, Jesus isn't in the business of putting the Amazon down in a certain place and holding it in that spot and not allowing it to move where the Nile is, or putting Everest in a certain place and not allowing it to move to South America, and then allowing your life to move all around the place. Jesus is not in that business. Jesus ensures that things go the way he plans them to go if the person is willing to listen and to submit to him. So, dear ones, it brings away all that worry and anxiety about marriage and career. It washes it away. Because all things work together for good to them that love God. And so you have a great sense that this dear person who made me, that I am not just thrown out by chance from time plus chance kind of operation in the universe, but that this dear person who made me knows exactly where I'm going. And he has the thing under control, and he can bring it about as he wants it. Immediately, of course, your life really becomes filled with the exciting adventures of the glory of the unpredictable. Once you begin to accept that. No longer is it a case of, oh, I want to ensure that my life's going this way so that this next thing will happen at year 2000 and this year will ha- this thing will happen at 2001. No, at last you begin to relax in your life and see Jesus knows where he wants me. So he may want me to be an engineer in Honeywell or he may want me to be a peanut seller in Rio. But whichever it is, he'll show me. And as long as it's what he wants, it's no big deal to me which it is. He may want me to be a teacher in Bloomington, or he may want me to be a house mother in Korea, but suddenly the whole universe opens out to you. And it's no longer trying to tread a little narrow path that is safe because you know it. I dare not go outside Bloomington because I don't know the rest of the world outside Bloomington too well. Or nobody knows me outside Minneapolis. At last, the whole of the world begins to open out to you. And so it doesn't matter whether he wants you to be a nurse in Fairview or whether he wants you to be a secretary in Moscow. But Jesus will get you to the place where he wants you to live your life. And loved ones, that's his plan, you know. His plan is that you should think of yourselves as sons and daughters of his dear father. And that this is his father's garden. And he created you to do a certain job in this garden. And you can relax and enjoy being in the father's garden. And as soon as you begin to treat him like that, there comes within you a spirit that cries up, Father, Father. And no longer do you you regard the universe as an unfriendly, hostile, strange place, but you regard it as the garden that belongs to your dear father, whom you know and whom you love, and who loves you and whom you can trust. And so life begins to be peaceful and begins to have sense and plan and order in it. And that's God's plan. What a catastrophic contrast if you do not accept that presentation of reality. If you really live as a practical atheist, as one who lacks any awareness that there is a loving Father controlling your life day by day. Loved ones, then you move into hell itself. You go to school and you think of yourself as that little 17-year-old. Not as a unique person who is created by a loving Father and by his dear Son for a certain purpose in their world, But you see yourself as a miserable little 17-year-old in the midst of those 2,000 maniacs in that that school. And you see, somehow or other, I have to bring myself before their attention. Somehow I have to get some of them to notice me. And you set about that miserable, slavish task of getting them to notice you. And so everything becomes subservient to that task. The sports that you should enjoy become a method by which you may somehow bring yourself before the attention of the coach. 
the football that you really should just enjoy playing because it's one of the lovely inventions God has given to his world, it becomes a ladder that you can use to climb up over somebody else so that somehow somebody will recognize you. And school for many of us, at least high school, was that kind of slavish attempt to get people to notice us. That old adolescent insecurity and that old adolescent uncertainty about yourself and self-doubt and self-consciousness seems all to stem from this feeling that, well, I wonder, is there anybody really significant who knows we're here? And I think many of us have felt that at times. I wonder, is there anybody who is really important anywhere in the universe who knows I'm here and who knows why I'm here? And somehow at high school, it begins to express itself in a desperate desire to let somebody notice us. At least if our peers notice us, or our coaches notice us, or the faculty notice us, at least it'll be somebody that notices us. And it'll take away that terrible feeling we have that maybe nobody knows we're here. Maybe nobody knows why we're here. And so you know how it goes. The clowning and the jokes, even your looks, all of those things we begin to use to make other people notice us and approve of us. And then you know the next step. We just come into a real slavery to that applause that we get from them. And it's not long before we would do anything to get them to approve of us. They recognized us yesterday when we did something funny, so maybe we'll do something funnier today and they'll recognize it. Or we said something clever in class last week and they noticed us, so maybe if we say something super clever this week, they'll notice us. And before you know it, loved ones, your life has ceased to be a free thing And it begins to be a slavery. A slavery to the applause of the peers that you have or the significant others whom you respect. Then we go up to university or we get into the early days of our work life. And really it tends to be a continuation of that attention seeking. And we tend to keep on wanting people to notice us. And so often you who have jobs know that the old joy of the job fades away and you begin to be concerned about whether somebody approves of the way you do it or whether somebody is acknowledging you sufficiently. If the other fellow gets the sale and you should have got the sale, then the old resentment comes up because you aren't getting the recognition you deserve to have. And then you know how another factor comes into the whole picture. Because you begin to look around and see what everybody else is running for. And they're obviously all running for the things that they need, materially. And they're living for the food and the shelter and the clothing. And it's not long before you begin to switch over and you see, oh, it was my singing and the glee club that got me attention before and it was cleverness that got me attention from my professors. Now I see it's getting as much food, shelter and clothing as you need and more than anybody else needs or has. And before you know it, the old life begins to be dictated by a new kind of slavery. And you begin to dedicate yourself to the principle of getting these things that everybody obviously feels they need, and so you must need to. Half the time you're getting them not because you need them, but because if you have more, more them of them than everybody else, it kind of gets your attention, gets your recognition, gets your approval. makes you feel that you're making some kind of a splash in this mass society. And somebody maybe will notice it. And who knows, maybe somebody way beyond this world will somehow notice it. And you know how the whole televisionitis has just increased that whole feeling. Because you somehow feel when somebody is up there in front of millions, well, at least he's noticed. Well, maybe he can't die without some angel out there somehow noticing that he died. And underneath in our subconscious, we keep on trying to get more of this stuff. Not because we need it, but because somebody might notice it. After all, Getty is noticed. After all, old Onassis is noticed. So maybe we'll be noticed. Even if we're only noticed on our block, we'll be noticed. And you know, loved ones, how it goes on from there. You begin to dedicate your life to the things that you need. And 
you decide, oh, I want another car, or I want another stereo, or I want a new coat. And you begin to enjoy doing certain things. I enjoy going out for meals, or I enjoy going on this kind of a vacation, or that kind of a vacation. And I enjoy this kind of friend, and I enjoy this kind of activity and recreation. And bit by bit, we make our demands greater and greater. Really, behind it all is the desire that somehow somebody will recognize we're there, or at least we'll recognize we're there ourselves. Maybe nobody else will know it, but we'll see how far we've come. And then, you know, it falls into slavery, especially as the old recession sets in and you see other people losing their jobs and you've just increased your standard of living again and again as you seem to get more efficient at earning the money. But then you come to a point either in a recession or when your job isn't so needed or when you come to a certain age in your life where you can't increase the income anymore and you begin to find them losing their jobs and then the old fear begins to grip your heart and you begin to wonder, will you be the next one? And then you fear every call that you get from the office. As your expenditure outstrips your income, you begin to fear every phone call that comes and every bill that comes through the mailbox. And then you find yourself really involved in just a slavish fear. And a spirit of slavish fear gets hold of your life. And you're just manipulated. You who wanted to manipulate the world so that you could use it as you wanted, you find yourself more manipulated by it than you are manipulating it. And you who wanted to be God of your own life and do what you wanted to do, find that almost everything else in your life is God over you. The car can send you into a tremor of worry about whether you'll be able to make the payments or whether you'll be able to make the repairs or not. The job sends you into a worry if it wants. Your boss can almost create whatever feeling he wants in you by doing anything. Everybody seems to be your God. Now, loved ones, those are the two alternatives. And you know, there really aren't any others. You either accept reality, which is that this dear person, Jesus, who is the son of the maker of the world, made you, knows why you're here, and has a plan for your life, and will guide you without any flaw at all. Or you accept that you are a chance little creature here among the rest of us, who has to somehow bring yourself before all our attention. Loved ones, it's either one way or the other. I'd point you to the verse that, that really we're studying today, and it, it just states it, you know, and that's where I'd just like to end, Romans 8 and verse 15. Romans 8 and 15, it's page 983. Romans 8 and 15. For... You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. And Abba is just Aramaic for Father. It just means when we cry, Father, Father. The person who made you is trying to get through to you this morning. And say to you, would you turn away from all those foolish goals that you've set yourself since high school days? And would you accept that I am your father and that I love you and that I have a plan for you to fulfill here in my universe and that I will lead you into it? And all you have to do is trust me and do what I tell you from day to day. And leave all the scrambling for the food, shelter and clothing to the others. And just concentrate on me. Loved ones, really. He's saying that to you.
And you're the only one who can change it. You're the only one who can change from that spirit of slavery onto fear into a spirit of sonship towards your maker whereby you call him Father, Father. And really the Aramaic, you know, would bear the interpretation Dad, Dad. And your maker wants you to think of him as your dad. As a dear person who knows you and has counted all the hair of your head and loves you and has life organized and can lead you into his plan if you'll trust him. I know, you know, I know the men here that I see of 40, 50, 60. I know you know so well what I'm talking about. But loved ones, I think those of us who are younger, even we're beginning to see it. You end up either as a miserable slave to everybody on earth but God. Or you take this stand that he, the maker of the world, is your father. And has a special job for you to do that nobody else can do. And, ah, oh, I don't know how to make you believe it, but, you know, that's it. That's what it is. It's not that other old scrambling on top of dog eat dog to keep your head above water. That's not it, you know. That's not where it's at. It's not that old scrambling up the mud heap to be king of the castle. That's Satan's lie. The world is not like that as far as God is concerned. You say to me, oh, but all the rest of the world is. Yeah, but he looks after you in the midst of all that chaos. All the darkness can't overcome the light, however much of it there is. Besides, he has control of the one that goes on forever and ever after this one ends. So it's good in this life and good in the next one. So, would you think about it, loved ones? Uh, those of you who are just worn out, you know, just the old body worn out, tired of the depressants, tired of the stimulants to try to keep up, and maybe about ready to face reality. I pray that that will be so. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Father, we would pray for each other here in this room morning because we really do love each other Father we would pray for any dear brother or sister here that is just fed up just worn out with the old slaving away to try to keep up anybody here who is just tired of living by fear Father Will you speak to them as they can understand and explain to them that you made them through the instrumentality of your son Jesus and that you know why they're here. Do you have a special plan for them? Father, we would pray that you would make this clear to each of our brothers and sisters who sit beside us in these seats this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we don't need to wait years or months to accept what you say. Thank you, we can accept it this morning. We can simply decide deep down in our hearts that we're tired of this kind of life, that it's the wrong way to live, and it's the wrong way to die. And we can decide, our Father, to look up to you this morning. And maybe for the first time in our lives, say, Father, I thank you for being my Father. And I thank you that my life has been created by you for you to use. And I now give it to you and ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit, to begin to make sense of it for your own glory and satisfaction and so that my own life will not be lost. We thank you, Father, that you will accept anyone who turns to you 
with a whole heart and keeps that promise for your glory. Amen.